Shalom and God bless you. Welcome once again to this season and this wonderful episode of the Shalom season. I believe God has kept you well and God has continued to speak his Shalom over your life. You know, I love this word Shalom because it means peace and prosperity, health and wealth and welfare, well-being, being well fed in a place where you are complete whole, having nothing lacking, nothing missing and nothing broken. This is the mind of God for you, for your family, for the things that you do in your household, the things that you do with your hands, in the thing that God has called you for, that you may walk in his perfect Shalom. And it is guaranteed to you even as you look up to him and trust in him. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 that God will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. The word perfect peace there is translated from the word shalom. Actually in the original text, the word there is shalom, shalom. So it is a double manifestation of shalom in your life. And today I want to wish you that shalom. But I want us to share uh, from the word of God today. And I believe that the Lord is going to speak to us. God is going to inspire us. God is going to do a new thing in our lives. And so if you can, you'll just turn with me uh, to the book of Mark, the book of Mark, and there's a very interesting story uh, here that uh, is very unique in the way that uh, the Bible uh, records it, uh, because the Bible speaks about a season in time when there was a man uh, by the name of Jairus who begins to seek after Jesus, and this man Jairus had one intent. His intention was to see his daughter Healed. And so we're going to pick up that story from the book of Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. This is one of the repeated stories in the gospel, but we're going to read from Mark chapter 5. And then I want us to just understand a few uh, principles here on how to tap into the blessing and to tap into the favor and the grace that God has released for us. In other words, there is virtue, there is goodness that is in Christ. But for you to receive it, you need to be positioned to tap into it. Not everyone and not anyone can receive it. But in the same way, everyone and anyone can receive it. Now, I know that sounds contradictory. It sounds uh, like a tongue twister of sorts, but you'll understand where I'm coming from even as we read uh, the scripture at this particular time. Now, many of us may not be familiar with what I'm wearing today, so allow me just to introduce uh, this particular garment or clock um, what I'm holding and placing on my shoulder is known as a prayer shawl. A prayer shawl is uh, what a Jewish rabbi and most of them who would worship God and go into the temple or the tabernacle, they would wear this. Now, in the times of Christ, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ had a prayer shawl, and that's one of the distinguishing aspects of Jesus Christ. You see, some of us who live in our times may think that Jesus was wearing a three-piece suit, um, but in the real sense of the word, he wore what they would wear in that particular time, and everyone who saw Jesus would identify him as a rabbi. Now, for him to be identified as a rabbi, even just by sight, it was because he wore a prayer shawl. Now, in the Hebrew language, this is known as a talit. A talit. Now, a talit um, uh, simply means, uh, uh, the word talit is the shoots or um, the burning of a plant, that which is starting up and bringing life. And, and a talit is, 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 is named so because of a number of things, because it has this tassels or these, um, they're called tzitzis, which are the actual roots. Now, these tassels, there are four of these tassels on every corner of this particular garment. And I think it's important I mention this because as we share through this story, you will be able to understand why it is important for me to wear this and to explain uh, what this actually means to a Hebrew man or to a Hebrew woman. Now, at every corner of this a tassel or this charm, a corners, uh, there is, um, if you were to see it closely, this is 
a string, or it is actually uh, eight strings that have been bound uh, together, and these eight strings are uh, put into by notes. Now, this has been tied by experts, uh, Jewish rabbis. Uh, this is 663 notes. Now, 663 notes uh, connotes the fullness of the law. It's a pattern of the law. Uh, but eight strings here, which is what I'm talking about, the tzitzit, these are budding roots or, or, or shoots, or what is coming up from the ground, bringing in new life. They are eight to symbolize new beginnings because the number eight is always a number of new beginnings. But this is what is normally translated in the Bible as the hem of the garment. This is the hem of the garment. Now, you need to understand that in Jesus' time, when he speaks and teaches about prayer and says that anyone who wants to come to God must come into his closet, again, in our normal mind, we think that a closet there would mean getting into some kind of a cupboard and locking yourself uh, behind some doors. But the actual translation, and for the people who are part of his congregation, they understood very well when he said your prayer closet because when you took this prayer shawl and you covered your head in this manner, then you have entered into your prayer closet. So when Jesus was referring to a prayer closet, this is what he was making a reference to. Now, having said that, I believe you are beginning to understand a few things. I'm not uh, necessarily teaching on the prayer shawl. My necessity today is not to talk about the tzitzit or the talit or the significance of it, but it's important for me to mention this so that you can understand where I am coming from and so that you can see this scripture in perspective. Now, the Bible says, and I'm now beginning to read the verse I've just introduced. Um, this is Mark chapter 5. It says, And when Jesus passed over again by the ship to the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. Now, this is a continuation of a story. Jesus has just come from the other side, uh, crossed over the land of the Gedarines or the Decapolis, uh, 10 cities as it were. And from there, uh, Jesus has just performed a miracle, delivered a demoniac man who had been demon possessed for a long time. And on his way to deliver this man, they had encountered some drama in the Sea of Tiberias where there was this heavy duty storm that had hit against their boat. And of course, Jesus deliberately had slept through the storm because Jesus had spoken to the disciples and told them, let us go over to the other side. The problem was they heard Jesus speak, but they could not correlate his word to the circumstance. And beloved, I want you to understand that many times we hear Jesus speak, but we forget it because we keep our eyes on circumstances and on issues instead of keeping our eyes on God. Remember, we've just quoted Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, where the Bible says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. So if you want to walk in perfect peace, then you have to keep your mind on what Jesus said. Jesus did not speak to the disciples and say, let us go and die in the middle of the lake. He said, let us go to the other side. And so he slept because he had already released his sure, certain word. And he knows, he knew that they were going to get over to the other side. But the disciples, when the storms, the tempest was raving and raging and roaring round about them, they forgot his word and they began to murmur and to complain and they woke him up and said, Lord, don't you worry. Don't you care that we are perishing. And Jesus told them, man, where is your faith? And he spoke to the storm and he said, peace, be still. And immediately he said, peace be still. Uh, suddenly the storm 
quieted because the word of God had gone forth. It had to quieten because it could not stop them because he who had created the storm had already spoken in advance and said, we are going over to the other side. So you need to understand that if Jesus has spoken to you, when he has released his word towards your life, you need to hold on to that word firmly. You need to refuse to quit. You need to refuse to be distracted because what the devil comes to do in our lives many times is to try and discourage us by the circumstances that are around us. He tries to dis. Uh, us, in other words, to move us away from the thing of God, of course, if he can distract you and he can discourage you, then he will be able to be in a position to discredit the word of God. In other words, he will say God's word does not work. But I know God's word works, and that's where we are sharing together, even at such a time as this. And so the Bible then continues the verse that we've just read, that they went over to the other side, and they returned safely. And when they arrived, there were people who now came to them. And verse 22 says, and behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue by the name of Jairus. Now Jairus uh, was a ruler of the synagogue, and so he, when he saw Jesus, he knew this is a rabbi, and he had had him teaching. And so he came and he fell by his feet, the Bible says. And let me just continue reading very quickly. It says, in verse 23, And he besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth upon death, and I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, that she shall live. 24, And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. Now, I want us to take note of verse 25. It says, And a certain woman, which heard an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of the physicians and had spent all that she had and had nothing grown better, but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, she came in in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be Whole. And straight away the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned in the press and said, Who touched me? And who touched my clothes? And he said, The disciples said to him, the multitudes are thronging thee. And why sayest thou, who touched me? And she looked around to see what done this thing. Verse 33, and the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be free of thy plate. Now I want to take note that many times Jesus released the word of peace, the word of shalom, the word of Irene as it is uh, translated in the Greek. So Christ Jesus in his ministry, he released his peace. Not as the world was giving peace, but as he is giving peace. He spoke to the storm and released peace and said, be still. He speaks to this woman and say, go in peace and behold. Why? Because this woman had taken a step of faith and touched the hem of the garment of Christ. And I told you earlier that because Jesus is a Jewish rabbi, he was wearing a prayer shawl, a talit like this one, and the woman touched the hem of the garment, the tzitzi, which is symbolic of the word or the law or the Torah in summarized a pictorial form. And so then the scripture goes on to say, and as, as Jesus is speaking to this woman, verse 35, and when he spoke, the ruler uh, heard from those who had come from his house and said that thy daughter is dead, and so do not trouble the master any farther. And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he suffered no one to save, to follow him, save Peter, James, and John, and the brother. And of course, we know the story. It says that when Jesus came into the house of Jairus, found this young lady, sure enough, she was dead, uh, and the people around about had thronged for a long time. And Jesus said, well, she's only sleeping. And um, if you read verse 40, they said that they laughed him to scorn. But he put them all out and he took the damsel and the mother and he called out, holding her hand and said, Talitha kumi, which being interpreted says, damsel, I say to thee, arise. And straight away, the damsel arose and walked. Now, the principle I want us to understand, which is very important in this story, because it 
pictures two interweaving stories. Now, whenever the Bible has a record, it's not a coincidence, it's not an accident, it's not something that just happens per adventure. Uh, God has allowed it for a reason, and there are specific lessons that I believe God wants us to draw uh, from the Word and in the interaction of the people of that particular season with God's Word. Because Jesus is the Word of God. He is epitomized as the Word. That's why the Bible says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. And goes on ahead to define that this Word is Christ. He became flesh. He became Rema. He became tangible. We could touch Him with our own hands. We could feel Him. And we saw Him, as it were, walking on the face of the earth in flesh and doing what was written for Him in the book, the Bible says, I have come in your name to fulfill all that was written for me in the volume of the book. Now, it's important for us to take note that here are two uh, distinct people. There is Jairus. Jairus is a head of the synagogue. Uh, Jairus is an honorable person. But when he comes to Jesus, he has a need. The need is the daughter who is 12 years old, is sick and is almost dying. He is desperate to save the life of the dying daughter. So when he comes to Jesus, he asks Jesus, please come to my house and heal my daughter. Now, this is the word of God that Jairus is interacting with. He's interacting to Christ the Lord, the one who created heavens and the earth, as we read in John chapter 1. But when he comes to him, he does not fully comprehend the power and the capacity that is inherent in Christ. And so he asks him to come to his house, in other words, to walk in his bodily form with the limitation that he has in his bodily form and to take the amount of time it would take for that limitation to get to his house so that he can speak and that his daughter would... Now, he had faith, but there was a limitation to the level and the timing of what he was going to receive. But at the same time comes this woman, and this woman understands that this is Jesus. And this woman had a few challenges. Number one, she now had been bleeding for 12 years. The scripture says she had been to every manner of physicians. Now, when you read some particular parts of scripture, it's good to read, just to, 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 to think a little. What was the kind of challenge this woman had in that particular time? And I can tell you for free that medicine in those days was not medicine as we know it today. Uh, those were the days that they had not invented anesthesia. So if you went to a doctor and you needed to have an operation, then they in those days would use physical anesthesia, someone would actually get a hammer and clobber you at the back of your head and then you went into some kind of semi-coma. And they would be waiting there with a mallet just in case you wake up so they could send you back again uh, to sleep. That was how crude it was. If this woman had been in this circumstance and had lived through all the physicians and spent all she heard, you don't want to understand the kind of trauma and the kind of abuse that she had gone through at the hand of doctors who must have used every manner of medicine and experiment to try and relieve her, but in the process burden her with so much trouble. But the principle I want us to understand is that this woman, despite the fact that she had been so through much, so, I mean, through so much, she had made up her mind, I will not give up. And my prayer is that even as you hear me today, you will be the kind of person that will refuse to quit and give up because your answer is surely coming. The God whom we serve is a God who hears and answers and comes through for those who will seek him and those who will trust him. And as you call upon him, he never fails and he will surely answer you. And so the scripture then says that this woman uh, followed after Christ, but she had another challenge. The law, the written law was against her. The written law was against her. How do I know this? The Bible teaches us in Leviticus chapter 14 that any woman who was in her season or her menses season for that particular matter was unclean. And the Bible teaches us in the law that everywhere she touched or things that she sat on 
were unclean. In fact, she was not even supposed to interact with people because she was unclean. It was against the ceremonial laws in the scripture for this woman to interact with people. But at this particular time, she had made an assessment and decided to take a risk so that she could get her healing. Now, you know, faith is always a risky business. Faith is a risky business. But whenever you engage in faith, you are guaranteed to receive returns because God is a faithful God. God can never call you and ask you to do specific things that he, he, he knows are risky and he will not intervene to show himself strong on your behalf. And such was the kind of scenario of this woman. And so she made up her mind. She knew if the Jews caught her interacting with her, knowing the kind of situation, knowing the type of uncleanliness that she carried. She was like a, a leper. She was like an outcast. She was like someone who uh, was um, not supposed to be anywhere close to people. She was supposed to be secluded. She was supposed to be on her own. But she knew she had to interact with the word of God. And the scripture says, then she began to press in, knowing full well if she was discovered, they were going to stone her to death. They were going to kill her for making everybody and clean. But she kept on pressing, and the Bible says all she was targeting was to get a hold of the hem or the tzitzi of the talit. When the Bible says she touched the hem. Now, I told you earlier that the talit symbolically was molded and weaved so that the edges of them were a consummation, were a so to speak, consolidation of the word of God. So this woman had an idea that if only I can touch the hem, I can call, I mean, I can touch him who is the fullness, the word of God condensed together as it were. If I could just touch that, I will be made whole. That was her faith. And she believed that as soon as I touch, I'm going to be healed. And indeed, as soon as she touched, the Bible says Jesus felt virtue, leave him, and he knew something had happened. And so he turned around and said, who touched me? Because every time you come to God and you touch his word, any time you come and believe his word, every time you come to Christ and get a hold of his fullness in belief and in faith that the work that Christ has accomplished for you, what he did at Golgotha. Every time you get a hold of him in faith, you are guaranteed to receive a release of power. All you need not to do is to doubt, is to have unbelief or to fear the crowd or what people are going to say or what people are going to do. You need to push in be behind and beyond those that are limit you, break the barriers and get to hold on to the fullness of the word of God. Because that's where you have your healing, your deliverance, your prosperity, your transformation. Whatsoever thing you need to see, it is hidden in the word of God. And so this woman received even before Jairus, who was a synagogue leader, who had come and reported his case earlier. Now, Jairus was walking with the word. Jairus was with the word. Now, we know from the Bible that there were men who believed in the word that can be sent. The Bible teaches us that he sent his word and his word healed them. And the Bible talks about a centurion who came to Christ and said, you see, uh, I'm a man in authority and I understand authority. And you, you, you know, I speak to one and I say, go and he goes. And I speak to another, come and he comes. And so I understand that you, Jesus, have authority. And whatsoever thing you speak, your word has power. So I don't need you even to come to my household, if you speak, I know there's going to be healing in my household. Now, Jairus was a teacher in the synagogue, but he did not understand that. In fact, Jesus said concerning that centurion, who was actually a Roman citizen, that you have great faith. He marveled at the faith of one who was not a Jew, at one who was not of the household of Israel, who had faith to believe that the word sent 
has power. Now, Jairus is walking with the word, but he's not beseeching the power in the word. He's not getting a hold of the word. He has interpreted things the way he has interpreted by his own limitation. And in his own limitation, he had only thought the word would work if Jesus gets into his house and prays over the daughter. But immediately after this woman touches the hem of the garment because she presses in and has faith and has a relief of 12 years of an ailment, suddenly a report comes from Jairus' house and the report was, your daughter who is 12 years old is now dead and do not bother the master anymore. Now this is amazing. It's an amazing teaching because, you see, it's, it's interesting because when, 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 when Jesus hears this, he says, do not fear, only believe. It, it's a very simple yet very profound thing because many times we are too concerned about the reports that are coming. But the question is, are you with the word? Are you walking with the word? Do you have the opportunities to tap in from the word? Because there are those who will come and they will have a revelation and get a hold of the word and tap it and receive. But are you going to hold on even when there are challenges, even when the circumstances and environment changes? You need to understand that he who is God is also the word. God is his word. The word is God. Never uh, underestimate the power that is inherent in the word of God. And that's why we are preaching the word. Because even as you hear this word, when you believe it, there's going to be a change in your life. There's going to be a change in your family. There's going to be healing in your body. There's going to be transformation. Because what God can do is far beyond what you could think or ask or even imagine. And so the scripture says, this gentleman decided to disregard what the people were saying and listen to what Christ said. And they kept on walking. Understand, Christ allowed himself to stay within the limitation of Jairus. Let us go to your house as you asked that we go to your house, and I will do it when we get to your house. He could have done it a different way if Jairus had released his faith beyond the limitation that he heard. But Jesus constrained himself to operate within the limitation of Jairus. Wherever we limit God with, that's how God releases grace into our lives. And so the Bible is clear that when Jesus got into the house of Jairus, it is at that particular time, though the daughter was dead, there was now power enough to raise up this damsel and say, damsel, arise. There were so many mourners there, Jesus put them aside. He said, no, the daughter is not a dead, she's, she's just asleep. And the scripture says that these guys actually began to laugh. It's amazing. But I've, I've been to parts, even in our own nation of Kenya, where people are mourning and people are crying. And, and they have professional mourners that even come to mourn. And, and they are crying. But when you bring in some food and some soup, suddenly people stop the mourning and the crying. They begin to harvest the food and to eat the food. And immediately the food is done, they switch gears again and they begin to uh, mourn. And such was the kind of Jewish company that was there. They were crying one moment. Then Jesus says, the daughter is not dead. He is sleeping. They began to mock the master and to laugh at him. Put them aside and then spoke the word and said, damsel, arise. Today I want you to understand that the Lord Jesus that we preach, he is in his fullness. And when you get a hold of this word, as it comes into your sitting room, through your screen, there is nothing lacking in the word. When you believe this word, it has power to do whatsoever thing you will believe God for in this particular time. So I guarantee you that God is a God who follows after his word that he may perform it and he's going to do it for you. I pray for peace and grace on your life as you act on the word. Let this word act on you. As you work on the word, may this word work on you. As you walk with him and walk in him, may he do a quick thing in your walk and in your trust. May you experience the blessing and the favor of God. I declare to you, you are blessed for life. God's favor, God's goodness is upon your life and I know your life will never be the same again because God promises it and what he says, he's also going to do it. Thank you for watching and I believe the word is already working in your life. Shalom. God bless you.